In this episode of Going for Green, we take a safari to a nature conservancy, putting environmentally friendly beef on our plate. We discover a green way of turning waste tires into fuel. Farming without soil, a green revolution that is finding its way into East Africa. And wondering what to do with those plastic bottles? A youth group is turning them into solar lamps in one of Africa's biggest slums. Our story begins southwest of Kenya, in a vast plain about 1,500 square kilometers. Covered by grassland and spotted with acacia trees, it is known as the Maasai Mara, home to a rich array of wildlife and the Maasai. An important ecosystem under threat from commercial agriculture. The Maasai call this place home. They have for centuries. It is their belief that they came down from the skies on a large cowskin hide with all the cattle in the world. It is these animals that are their lifeblood. A cow is really very important because it is the only the cow that the Maasai see the benefit of, that is the economy of the Maasai. And it's also an heritage from their grandfathers and their grand-grandfathers. So they want to maintain that the heritage of the cows in the Mara. We actually came to the Mara, bought a patch of land, we fenced it, started maize farming. Maize farming is one of the commercial enterprises threatening the Maasai Mara ecosystem. What Tarquin and neighboring Maasai landowners have done is turn their farms into Enongishu Conservancy, coming together to protect wildlife. We're trying to reenact the Maasai's gone past. We're trying to become more nomadic. Traditionally, the Maasai were nomadic, moving from pasture to pasture. But development has meant Maasai homesteads have become more permanent. This has meant that their cattle always walk back home for kilometers, eroding land in their path. These mobile bomas, we are able to move around as we graze, so the cows don't have to walk so far to go back home. The Conservancy makes up 10,000 acres of land. Think of this as a massive pizza on which Tarquin and his team of Maasai move their cattle from piece to piece, grazing their cattle as they go. And the clever thing, their boma follows them. When we got this mirror, we got a chance to get the mirror, we got the chance to get the mirror, we got the chance to get the mirror, and we got the chance to get the mirror. But we got the chance to get the mirror, we got the chance to get the mirror, kufaulu vizuri imepata kukua na nafasi ya kurez sasa hakuna mambo mingi siku si mbaya mbaya kuhusu kumalisho These innovative mobile boomers also play another role towards conservation efforts The boomers are predator proof The lions cannot get into the boomers There is much less lion and community conflict Enongishu Conservancy relies on the grasslands for survival As a result they have adopted a holistic approach to ensure that this vital food source is available for their cattle and the wildlife. This is the grazing system used at Mara Beef. When grazing the cattle, they don't graze down to the lower level. They are moved through the land strategically, allowing them enough time to only graze to the half level. What's left is split between food for wildlife and ground cover to fight erosion during the rains. Before, it was very hard for the local to understand this holistic management approach. The weight gain per cow is what is really giving the community so much impressive that they really like their approach. The locals around here say they have not seen grass like this for 10 years. Our neighbour lost 200 cows in a drought. We lost 20. So I think in terms of management, there is a lot to be learned. All these efforts would mean nothing to the community if yields were not maximised. That's why Mara Beef have built an on-site slaughterhouse to get maximum price per kilo. We start with 11 cows, now we are almost 400. Having a slaughterhouse has fantastic opportunities for the people around. The average cow to get to Nairobi goes through seven different brokers. 
we're saying, no, you come with your cow and we'll take it to town. Being able to afford you a better price, we pay you on the kilo of the cow. So it's all very fair and transparent. Slaughterhouses have generally a very bad reputation for their wastewater, their smell, and their environmental impact. We have a biogas facility, which is where all the stomach contents goes into. It is then fermented and produces biogas. Also, that produces a lot of fertilizer, which then we put into our vegetables and onto our grass paddocks. The result of all these efforts is the production of high-quality, organic, grass-fed beef that raises the economic power of the local community. We are now selling to supermarkets. They like the upper quality. We're starting to see the community cattle getting better. We're starting to see more demand for better bulls. We're starting to see better cattle. The slaughterhouse has provided the community with a stable source of income, deterring them from unsustainable practices, saving the environment. Charcoal burning, there was hunting, but now they realize the importance of the slaughterhouse now. This has inspired the local community to do much more. There's only one mara, so we want to grow the grass without fences from our border to the end of the mara. Mara beef is supporting people in its heritage. We're saving the Maasai Mara, bringing wildlife back to places where they haven't been for a very long time. As we continue with this approach, the whole of the world will be protected and will live with a natural environment as it was before. Completely non-biodegradable, globally car tires are one of the largest and most problematic sources of waste. It is estimated that over 260 million tires are discarded annually, with more than half being burnt openly for fuel, giving off damaging levels of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We were concerned about the high number of tires that we see everywhere, you know, burning of tires in the estates where we live, when uh, they are combusted in the open, they are a great pollution to the environment. They destroy the ozone layer, and therefore they are extremely harmful to our environment. These tires would normally have no other use at all, and the only way to put them into good use is through this recycling process, which we call tire pyrolysis. At Aqualine, they are recycling tires through a process called pyrolysis. But in order to do that, they must first source the tyres from the community. We collect the waste tyres from the market, tyre dealers. We work with the community, we work with uh, street children. The tyres are then transported to their plant, where the process begins. We remove the ring from the first machine called wheel cutter, and then we take the remaining tyre, we cut in our culendine machine, which cut into small pieces. We load those small quantities in our reactor. A reactor is where oxygen cannot get inside, so it is called pyrolysis. The reactor is where the transformation from waste to reusable recycling materials takes place. At the beginning of the process, Aqualine uses firewood to start the burning. Once the tires start heating, they produce a flammable gas, which is then pumped back into the system to fuel the fire making it a self-sustaining process. So that's, that's the process. Once uh, it's complete, I mean, uh, tire oil generation is about 50, uh, 45%. We normally load to our reactor around 10 tons or 200 pieces of tires. We get almost 3,500 to 4,000 liters of IDO. One of the first people to take up the product of tyre oil has been the tyre manufacturers, the people who make the road making material. So we have been sending a lot of our product to them. Alternative fuel we are using is tyre oil, they make from tyres. It is really good oil, we are getting all the temperatures, what is required. And for us it is cheaper also, compared to diesel which is more expensive. Other than producing valuable tyre oil for road construction, there are other useful byproducts from the pyrolysis process. Once we are fitted, we normally rotate our reactor to cool to a certain temperature where we remove the remaining byproduct that's carbon black and steel wire. The carbon black has got very high calorific value as well, and we are able to use it basically as, as fuel to replace charcoal. We are able to make pellets, and with those pellets, they make it easy to handle 
and therefore you can use them in place of uh, charcoal at homes and in industrial places. The other byproduct is scrap metal, so we remove that to be used by the smelters. They use it as their raw material. Why you see tires being burned maybe in the estates or other places like that, whoever is doing that wants, is, is interested in the wire so that they can sell it as scrap metal. We are now giving them an alternative without any serious impact to the environment. The plant remains environmentally friendly as it allows none of the harmful gases to escape into the atmosphere. The reactor is completely sealed with no air getting into the system and no harmful emissions getting into the environment. The only smoke released comes from the oven that contains the firewood. The end product is tire oil that goes into a tank. It is not possible to pollute the environment using this. It's the safest way to deal with the waste tires. It's very clear that we are able to reduce pollution of the air. We are getting rid of all the strewn uh, tires everywhere, destroying it in a proper way. The plant has been up and running for 15 months. The successes are visible for all to see. And at Aqualine, they have won accolades in green innovation. We won a Green Innovations Award. It was because of the collection of waste tires countrywide. There's a lot of potential in this field because what we are dealing with in terms of the tires that we're handling at the moment is a drop in the ocean. Right now, we are considering putting in another two or three reactors and clean up the environment better. Did you know that 54% of deforestation is caused by slashing and burning for agriculture? That is why it is important to adopt conservation agriculture. At Hydroponics Kenya, they are pioneering and initiating hydroponic farming technology in East and Central Africa. Specializing in the manufacturing, installation and marketing of customized hydroponic systems to help small and medium holder farmers have access to a high quality, cost effective and sustainable way of farming. The reason why I found uh, hydroponics Kenya, initially I used to make livestock feeds and uh, fertilizer and also analyzing soil. But then uh, in my quest of looking for the best method of growing crops and also feeding livestock, I started researching how I can use the, 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 those traits you have seen and also make hydroponics in nutrients, which is the heart of hydroponics. Hydroponics basically means growing plants without the use of soil. At Hydroponics Kenya, they start off by using a system called vertical farming. This is where the plants are planted in tubes. Water containing the vital nutrients needed for plant growth is then added to the top level. The water feeds the plants at the top level and then drips to the lower levels, feeding the plants as it moves down. Water that is collected at the very bottom is recycled to the top level to start the process again, using less water compared to traditional farming methods. This technology is smart agriculture. There's no issue about uh, having to pick your jembe in the morning and go to the farm. There's no plowing, there's no weeding. Crops grow very fast and also it uses very little amount of water because now you can recycle water and the nutrients. So even the, the, the fertilizer is not to waste it to the environment. The technology works by feeding the broken down plant nutrients directly to the roots through the porous holding material. The method of feeding these nutrients to the plants is what encourages a rapid plant growth over a shorter period of time compared to conventional farming. We break down for the crop. It's like glucose, so that, so that the crop absorbs very fast. The soil offers something we call a buffering capacity. So it is very weak, but it's very ionic, so the crops absorb very fast. That is why you see the fodder is taking only seven days to grow as opposed to 12 weeks. At Hydroponics Kenya, they are innovative thinkers when it comes to creating efficient and effective ways to farm. Hydro oil is designed for people who don't have land. Already we have started doing 45 units in Nairobi. The hydro wall is an ingenious idea as anyone with a house with four walls can use this system. The hydro wall is mounted on walls of a house or fence and it's very simple in terms of labor. 
a tap containing the water and nutrients is turned on and water finds its way to all the pots and then goes to a reservoir which can then be recycled. One side of the wall can be used to, to feed the family of between five to six members of the family and the other three can, they can use for selling the, the vegetables. We have another system called the NFT. We have a pump which pumps at a predetermined intervals. After every 30 minutes, it passes for 12 minutes. So for that use, you find it, it, it takes only 30 days to harvest, as opposed to 60 days to use, use a conventional method. These systems don't only speed up plant growth, save water, save space and eliminate the need for fertilizer. They also protect greenhouses from agricultural diseases that find their way through the soil. We are not starting from the soil. We use peat because these are diseases that come from the soil, emanate from the soil. And here we are not using soil. Soil-borne diseases, you can 100% do away with them by using the hydroponic system. The hydroponic system is also highly organic, using environmentally friendly practices and only using chemicals when absolutely necessary. When you're not using the, the chemicals, you're, it's safe for everybody. You're not polluting the air, you're not polluting the water, so it's environmentally friendly. Installation is not enough. The team works hand in hand with farmers to ensure that this method of hydroponic farming is of maximum benefit to them. We have our technicians who are fully trained on how to install our various systems on the field. And then after the installation, we give the farmers some agronomic advice for the first season so that they can have the experience on how to use and maintain our system for the first season. Then for the second season, they can do it on their own. The hydroponics demo farm is a testament in itself to the farming potential that farmers and individuals alike can achieve on just one eighth of an acre. Our demo farm is only one inch of an acre. We have a, a greenhouse which supports 500 tomatoes. The vertical pipes has 1,500 clubs. This hydro wall with 45 strawberries. This lettuce is 450 lettuce, even up to 500 bags of barley seed. Production of fertilizer the other side. We can also have about a thousand pottery just in one inch of an acre because of using the vertical. I think horizontal in Kenya, the land is very expensive. With this in mind, it looks like hydroponics is becoming the next frontier for agriculture in Kenya. It increases yield by over 30 percent. It is clean. It is not time consuming. You use very small space and you get, you get uh, optimum yields. You get clean, clean uh, harvests and you're not polluting the environment. So. I'll, I'll encourage people, especially in the urban areas, in the peri-urban areas where we have uh, very little space, this is the way to go. I don't see any other technology which really be able to use less water than uh, hydroponics. Kibera is Africa's second largest slum. And, like many slums, the residential dwellings are simple, made of mud walls and a mabati tin roof. Few have windows and access to electricity is often difficult, leaving many of the dwellings dimly lit. This makes everyday living and even education difficult for its residents. Ya kwanza ilikuwa kama sima imepotea nilikuwa na shida sana. Kwa jili naenda kutafuta mafuta, sasa zingine inanipata sina pesa. Sasa kuka kwa nyumba ilikuwa ni shida kwa jili kuna darkness. Solar bottles tunazimeke kusaidia wale watu lights kwa wana na wenye maybe wana lights lakini wana dirisha unajua kunaweza kuwa joto kwa nyumba unashindwa wenye utazima light ufanye kazi so ndo tuka, tuka come up na hizi solar lights yeah the solar bottle is a simple thing is uh, eco friendly which uh, produces light during the night it produces light and day daytime also the process is simple and recycles old plastic bottles it's just a simple thing a bottle filled with water and then it produces light and water there is a detergent which is put inside like jig so the detergent make the water pure so it produces light it's just simple as that. 
or the first procedure ni kukat kumesha the edge. To make the solar bottles, you take a plastic bottle and measure the circumference of the bottle. Then, with a marker pen, mark the circumference on an iron sheet and cut a hole. Then put the bottle inside and add silicone. The silicone is left to dry for one or two minutes. Lastly, add the water and then the bleach. So, to make a I love to make a mabati. A local school has become a beneficiary of the solar bottle installations. The solar bottles have really helped us. Before they were installed, the classrooms appear to be dark. And again, uh, you see there is that inadequate uh, electricity supply. Some, sometimes the power goes off and it becomes dark. So it was very dark before the bottles were installed. That refraction of light made uh, the classroom so much well lit. It has been well with our library and uh, all other classrooms. And this has had a huge effect on the performances of the pupils. This is something that adds up to their performances. It has really helped, not only in the school. The same bottles also are installed in, on the roofs of the houses back at home. Sasa wakati nilipo nao wakaniwekea. Nilikuwa na furaha nyingi kwa jili. All the time nilikuwa na kakwa nyumba. Nasikia furaha kama stima imepotea sina wasiwasi. Naona ni kwa lightness, naona kila kitu. Nilikuwa siwezi kabisa. Naona nyumba iko darkness. Nasema niende wapi? Kwa jili uwezi kakwa nyumba kama ni dark. Una mafuta sayo. Na is advice watu wakubali wawekewe. As well as lighting up the home, there is a huge environmental benefit. Reusing uh, the, the bottles, we, we also keep the environment clean because we, we collect the bottles which are thrown everywhere and then we use them. With results like these available for all to see, the demand for the solar bottle is increasing. What we accept is that we can use the bottle, but funding is not the same, and we can use the bottle. With light no longer being an issue in homes, the local community is excited about a brighter future. Kifebe imenisaidia sana juu. Wakati huo, nilikuwa naeza tumia pesa sana, lakini wakati niliwekewa, naeza pata hata enye naeka kwa chama. Lakini wakati nilipo wekewa, nilikuwa na save hizo pesa. We have installed uh, more than 7,500 so far around Kibira. We have also ex extended our installation to Mombasa. We have installed in Changamwe. This thing is, uh, is eco-friendly. This thing is uh, health-wise is good. This thing uh, help uh, the poor, the less privileged in the, uh, in the community. With only, uh, only 250 shillings, these things last for so many years. Another way to use plastic bottles. Cut a plastic bottle in half. Tie a string on each half of the bottle. Hang it on a wall. Fill it with soil and plant anything you like.